Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Five Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. Coming up on this week's episode, end of support date has been set for Office 2016 and 2019. Also, problems with Windows 11 24H2 continue to plague its release, and startling reports about security headaches related to generative AI. For this and more, keep listening to this episode of the podcast, which of course, as always, is brought to you by my sponsors. And that includes Numescent, the inventors of the first and only cloud-native container management platform for Windows desktops. And of course, also brought to you by Master Packager, who make an application packaging software that helps you build packages that end users love, enterprises want, and the Windows OS needs. If you enjoy the show each week, you have these awesome sponsors to thank. And now for some news. One year from this week, October 14th, 2025, support will end for Office 2016 and 2019. That includes the Office suites, the standalone applications, and servers. And if that date rings familiar, that's because that's the same end of support date for Windows 10. So October 14th, 2025 is going to be a pretty big day. After that date, Microsoft says they will no longer provide security fixes, bug fixes, or technical support for Office 2016 or 2019. And continuing to use the software after end of support can leave your organization vulnerable to potential security threats, productivity loss, and compliance issues. Because migrations can take time, they recommend starting your upgrade from Office 2016 or 2019 to a supported version as soon as possible. And of course, their recommended path is to migrate to the cloud uh, with at least Microsoft 365 E3, which, of course, they want to sell you on Microsoft 365. They say in a fallback for disconnected scenarios, upgrade to Office LTSE 2024. To follow through on a story that I reported on on a previous episode of the podcast, Microsoft has officially deprecated the point-to-point tunneling protocol PPTP and Layer 2 Tunneling Protocol, or L2TP, in future versions of Windows Server, and they recommend admins to switch to different protocols that offer increased security. As part of this deprecation, future versions of Windows RRAS Server, VPN Server, will no longer accept incoming connections using the PPTP and L2TP protocols. However, users are still able to make outgoing PPTP and L2TP connections. To aid admins in migrating to SSTP and IKEV2, which are the recommended uh, successors to these now deprecated protocols, Microsoft has released a support bulletin back in June with steps on how to configure these protocols. And I'll share a link to that with this episode of the podcast, which you'll find over at fivebytespodcast.com under episode 356. Windows 11 24H2 users are finding there is an undeletable data that remains on their devices after installing the recently released feature update. The known issues list has not been increased in the days since the rollout. However, Users are reporting that when they make an attempt to clean up this wayward data that's up to 8.63 gigs of disk space, the data appears to persist regardless of how often a user attempts to delete it or restarts their Windows 11 desktop. The register reports that a scan of Microsoft's feedback hub confirms numerous people have reported this. Also related to Windows 11 24H2, Unfortunately, it appears recent patches KB5044284 for Windows 11 24H2 and KB5044285 for Windows 11 23H2 and 22H2 are also causing some problems. Users have been reporting that Windows updates get stuck in the update process at about 40%, and others have said that their updates get stuck between 90 to 95%. And after waiting several minutes without progress, Windows rolls back and undoes the update and then tries again. Others have also reported a strange error that causes the OpenSSH service to stop working. It just simply stops launching after updating with no error messages or logs indicating any error. PC World's website provides steps to handle these troublesome updates. So if you are encountering issues, you want to check out that and I'll share the link with this episode too. 
Also related to Windows 11 24H2, other issues have also been reported by people on the sysadmin subreddit, and I'll share a link to that. Now, you'll see some discussion on the subreddit with people saying, oh, I'm facing these issues, but then other people are saying, oh, I haven't run into that issue, and I fully upgraded uh, multiple machines to the new Windows 11 24H2. So it seems like perhaps uh, whatever the variables are involved when people are running into the issues has not been ironed out yet. So I expect Microsoft to possibly address some of these issues further in the coming weeks. Mac OS users are not to be left out of the recent misery as there has been reports of network issues on Mac OS Sequoia version 15.0.1. Uger Koch on Twitter shared that he has noticed some users are still facing internet connectivity issues on the OS and suggests that you should check if you have multiple network filters enabled as having more than one can cause network problems on the latest Mac OS. And this issue is not limited to Defender for Endpoint on Mac OS and can affect other security software vendors and VPN applications too. So if you've got a VPN installed and it's putting in another network filter, then you may encounter this issue. BleepyComputer.com reports that after a cyber gang made claims they breached Cisco earlier this month, Cisco has moved to confirm to the outlet that it is investigating these recent claims that it suffered a breach after a threat actor began selling allegedly stolen data on a hacking form. Some of the data possibly compromised includes GitHub projects, GitLab projects, Sonar Cube projects, source code, hard-coded credentials, certificates, customer SRCs, Cisco's confidential documentation, Jira tickets, API tokens, AWS private buckets, Cisco technology SRCs, Docker builds, Azure storage buckets, private and public keys, SSL certificates, and Cisco premium products, and more. So it seems like they got quite the loot out of this, if this is true. Cisco stated that they are aware of reports that an actor is alleging to have gained access to certain Cisco-related files, and that they've launched an investigation to assess this claim, and the investigation is ongoing. So obviously Cisco has very significant customers in enterprise. I mean, I don't think there's any company that I worked for that was not using some Cisco products within them. So this is going to be very worrying for customers. Marriott International and its subsidiary Starwood Hotels will reportedly pay $52 million and create a comprehensive information security program as part of settlements for data breaches that impacted over 344 million of its customers. And this is a story that I feel like I've been uh, reporting on for years now. The settlement requires Marriott and Starwood to implement a comprehensive security program and allow their U.S. customers to request personal data deletions. Additionally, the American hospitality giant has agreed to pay $52 million to 49 states to resolve claims related to its data breaches. BleepComputer.com reports that as part of the settlement agreement, Marriott and Starwood will now have to implement some of the following measures, and that includes establishing a comprehensive information security program with third-party assessments every two years and annual compliance certification for 20 years, uh, also limit data retention to what is necessary and inform customers of the reason for collecting and keeping their data. Also allow customers to request reviews of unauthorized activity in their loyalty accounts and restore stolen points. Also provide a way for customers to request deletion of personal information linked to their email or loyalty account and also prohibit misrepresenting how personal data is handled and ensure transparency and security practices. All of those measures seem to just be pretty logical and something an organization should already be doing. And frankly, it seems like uh, regulation will kind of dictate a lot of this in terms of the data handling, at least in some countries. But yeah, this story really dragged out for a long time, it feels. In a case of extreme fallout after a data breach, there has been further reports that suggest the genealogy company 23andMe could fold. This comes just weeks after several executives resigned from the company. CBS's news report on the matter provides warnings and guidance for customers of 23andMe in order to extract their data. 
In a follow-up story to a story I covered on multiple episodes of the podcast in the past, Tech Target reports Broadcom and AT&T are now in discussions to settle their VMware support licensing dispute outside of the courts. The company sent a joint letter from AT&T and Broadcom legal teams informing the New York State Supreme Court on Friday, October 11th, asking for a delay in proceedings. The companies were originally scheduled to deliver opening remarks on October 15th, but both parties have been engaging in a settlement discussion and believe enough process has been made to warrant an adjournment. Attorneys of both companies asked to move the opening remarks to October 22nd, and Broadcom has also agreed to provide an additional week of support for AT&T beyond that date if scheduling conflicts arise. So it seems like there's some progress being made between the two companies. LeapyComputer.com reports that Google Chrome's web store is now warning that the uBlock Origin ad blocker and other extensions may soon be blocked as part of the company's deprecation of the Manifest V2 extension specification. And if you listen to the podcast, this should not come as a surprise because uh, this has been reported on previously. But they now say the extension may soon no longer be supported because it doesn't follow best practices for the Chrome extensions. The warning includes a link to a Google support bulletin that states the browser extension may be disabled to protect users' privacy and security. So I guess jump on board or get thrown overboard. In sad news, Ward Christensen, who is the co-inventor of the computer bulletin board system BBS, has died at the age of 78 in Rolling Meadows, Illinois. In the 1980s and 1990s, BBS introduced many home computer users to multiplayer online gaming, message boards, and online community building in an era before the internet became widely available to people outside of science and academia. It also gave rise to the shareware gaming scene that led to companies that we have today like Epic Games. Last week, Pillar's State of Attacks on Gen AI report was published and it revealed new insights on large language model attacks and jailbreaks. Based on telemetry data and real-life attack examples from more than 2,000 AI applications, it suggested that attacks on LLMs take less than a minute to complete on average and leak sensitive data 90% of the time when successful. Chatbots are the most targeted for attack purposes, and but scworld.com covered the report and covered many different aspects of how the AI is being leveraged and also how attackers are able to jailbreak through the AI security protocols to leverage it for their own attacks. And I'll share a link to that article if you want to read more about it, and I suggest you do. And to wrap up the news for this week, bleepycomputer.com reports that a report by OpenAI presented cases of Chinese and Iranian threat actors, leveraging it to enhance the effectiveness of their operations. OpenAI has disrupted over 20 malicious cyber operations abusing its AI-powered chatbot for debugging and developing malware, spreading misinformation, evading detection, and conducting spear phishing attacks. The report, which focuses on operations since the beginning of the year, constitutes the first official confirmation that generative AI mainstream AI tools like ChatGPT are being used to enhance offensive cyber operations. But really, I think everyone already knew that. This is just like confirmation of that from an official uh, Gen AI vendor and source. But now this episode's scripts, tricks, and tips. First tip for this week is to check out another great podcast, which is Run As Radio. And specifically, I'd suggest checking out the latest episode, which is on OpenAI for PowerShell with Doug Fink. Uh, So I think I've covered Doug Fink's awesome PowerShell module in the past on this podcast, and certainly at a couple of different user group events where I did AI-related sessions. I strongly suggest you check out the PowerShell module Uh, because it can provide incredible time saving and efficiency in your PowerShell scripting, and it can help automate some things you may not have been able to automate in the past with traditional scripting methods. Um, And I'll share a link, obviously, to that podcast episode, and I suggest you check it out, and that'll be with this episode, which is episode 356, and you'll find that at 5bytespodcast.com. Now, the next tip comes directly from Microsoft, who say that you should always unenroll from MDM when unjoining and rejoining Microsoft Entra hybrid devices. 
They say if the device isn't unenrolled from MDM before rejoining, critical device properties can be misaligned. The device's policies and certificates are removed because the system no longer recognizes the device's original object ID, leading to inconsistencies in how settings and software are applied. This includes attributes like the order ID and OS properties that Intune uses for dynamic group targeting. Failing to properly manage the unjoin and rejoin process can result in device targeting issues where policies and configurations do not apply correctly and disruptions in Windows Autopilot configurations, potentially leaving devices mismanaged or without the necessary apps and settings. So there's a pretty significant impact by not doing this. Uh, so just beware if you do have those hybrid uh, devices today. I saw my buddy Jeremy Moskowitz uh, replied to uh, one of the tweets from a Microsoft employee about this asking the question of like what changed uh, because hybrid devices have been around for some time now uh, I'd be interested in an answer to that as well because it seems like this has significant risk but finally for this episode scripts tricks and tips just to promote a little bit of my own work uh, recently I published a video around why I believe Windows 11 adoption uh, rate is low and has been a problem for enterprise IT and uh, you know spoiler Windows 10 end of support like I mentioned at the top of the show uh, is now less than a year away by the time you listen to this and considering the late great Chris Jackson from Microsoft who is just an awesome dude um, had said before that your typical OS version update migration project takes 12 to 18 months a lot of organizations who have not started yet are already behind the curve on this. Um, so I just kind of share some of my insights around, you know, Windows 11, uh, the need to migrate to Windows 11, and the fact that Windows 11 adoption has been relatively low so far. And I'll share a link to that as I do everything I mention on every episode of the podcast. And I encourage you to check that out. But that's it for this episode of the podcast. As always, thank you so much for listening.